we're going to get started. So we're offering 12 rules for successful grant writing, and I'm going to turn it over to my friend Jana, who is going to kick us off with the first rule. Thank you, Ryan. I am delighted to be here with all of you friends today and talking about our favorite subject. Um, my name is Jana Barrett. I'm with the Lincoln Financial Foundation and I've been with Lincoln a little over 11 years working in the Greensboro community on a number of key issues related to community health and wellness, um, looking at um, education, health and human services, the arts and financial wellness are key areas. We fund in 11 cities across the U.S., but Greensboro is one of our largest locations in our hometown and very, very proud of the work that we have done, partnered with a lot of, um, of you over the years. So, so the love language or the, the tool that I, or I'm sorry, let me start over again. The rule that I am sharing with you today is understanding each funder's love language. And I want to preface my remarks and probably remarks for the group that we are all unique and different. And we all have different goals and different stakeholders, different objectives. And so what you might hear from one may not necessarily apply to all. So I'm gonna to try to broaden this a little bit so that it, um, it does connect. But um, you know, when you think about how you communicate with the people in your life, when you think about um, some folks really like to text, and some would rather you pick up the phone and call them. Uh, some are on Facebook and Instagram and some people really prefer LinkedIn. And so we have really learned um, as a society how to you know, intuitively hone in on the ways that different people and different organizations communicate. And I think that that's um, an, a critical piece of development work and fundraising and particularly grant writing. Um, Every organization has its own culture. And if you've ever gone on someone's website when you're maybe applying for a new position or you're looking at their funders page or their guidelines, you'll notice that they use you know, certain words. There's catchphrases or there's just different words. And those give you clues to an organization's culture. Um, oftentimes I've heard mentors say that when you're applying for a position, you might want to use back, if they align, you want to use back some of the words that that company or that organization uses. And you find that common ground, you find that commonality that you want to share with that organization. That's, there's no difference there than there would be in understanding your funders. And you probably have a wide variety of funders. You've got family foundations like the Simula Foundation and corporate folks, and then um, you know our arts and, and state and local funders as well. And every one of those has different stakeholders and different objectives that they have to reach. So one of the biggest things when I made the transition from being a development person to working on the philanthropy side was understanding the stakeholder objectives and the needs of the funders. We all answer to someone. Um, it doesn't matter which side of the fence you're sitting on. You have a board of directors, you have someone that's setting the guidelines. And, and so you have to work within those parameters. It's important um, then to understand what those are. So while program fit is absolutely critical, um, understanding your um, funders love language or understanding their objectives is just as important. So it, while you're going through your process and they're asking questions, it's a good practice to just ask them what they're looking for. Why are they interested in your organization? Why are they um, investing in you? What is, and, and what do they expect to get out of that relationship? Because we're answering for that as well. And um, that will help you as you're developing your application and as you're fine tuning that, you can use common words, you can find that common ground and you can really hone in on what they need. So I would certainly say, I'll speak at this point more specifically to Lincoln, we use we first language. And if you know Lincoln Financial and you know our legacy company, Jefferson Pilot, we have never been an organization to toot our own horn. We don't generally go out and talk about the work that we do but we kind of love it when other people talk about what we do. So, um, so we always tell our grantees, you know, you know, we want, you know, if, if you feel strongly about the work that we're doing, we would love for you to share that. So 
So I think I've gone over my time, Ryan. So I'm going to um, turn it over to our next person. Thank you, Jana. Rule number two will come to us from Susan. But we will ask her to unmute before. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> that doesn't count for your time, Susan. Oh, thank you. You know, I'm so worried because we're by the railroad tracks. So I'm really careful to mute and then I forget. But anyway, I was saying good afternoon to everybody. I'm Susan Schwartz. I'm with the Seymour Foundation. We're a relatively small family foundation of Caesar Cone, who was the head of Cone Mills for many years. I've been here for 15 years. And uh, our main areas of focus are early childhood development, workforce development and training, and then an area we call innovative spaces and opportunities. So my rule two is a call or preferably visit before submitting a grant application. And what I would say is some of what Jana has said, but this contact that you make really sets the tone for the grant making relationship that goes forward. Giving is personal. It, um, relationships make a difference. And think about if you personally were giving away money, what would encourage you to do so and what would discourage you? And it is the same, I think, with foundations, certainly with ours. Uh, I like to think of giving in three categories. Uh, there's what I consider the obligation. <laughs> this is what it means to be part of a community. So for me, those are things like giving to your church, giving to Arts Greensboro, giving to United Way, perhaps Urban Ministry or the Salvation Army. They're just things that you want to give to organizations. Then there's something that you might personally enjoy. And in that category, I would put uh, the symphony, EMF, colleges and universities, Green Hill, community theater, public art. And then there are the causes. Then the causes could be hunger, they could be housing, health, the environment, uh, public school education might be one. So when you're making this contact, you need to figure out what is driving the foundation. What are the interests of the board of directors who will make the decision about the gift? And you also are using this contact time to sell yourself. You want to sell that you're competent. You have a sense of humor. Uh, you represent a worthy institution or cause or an initiative and that you are making a difference. I think COVID has hurt some of the relationships, but I'll have to say we made a recent grant to Compass. I never met with Catherine Hubert, but I talked to her on the telephone numerous times. She answered every question I had with detailed emails. And so we were able to get around that lack of personal contact. I think you um, need to follow the guidelines outlined by foundations. I love hearing from somebody who says, I want to see if we are a fit for Simula. I don't like when people come to us and they tell us they're a fit and really they're not. <laughs> and they're just kind of squeeze what they're doing into what is important to us. Um, and I would just end with some examples of relationships. Um, it's easy to give to well-established organizations, but I've found that I can be impressed by individuals who have taken on a challenge due to personal commitments. And by talking to them, I figured that out. And I put in that category, uh, organizations like Backpack Beginnings, Black Suit Initiative, Peace Haven Community Farm, and Compass Greensboro, which I mentioned earlier. And then for very large gifts, often we will have extensive contact, um, trying to develop in collaboration a grant opportunity uh, that an example would be working with UNCG or North Carolina A&T where the gifts might be as much as 500,000 or more. And we wanna have something that our board will really be responsive to, but also that works for the university. So that will take many conversations. Uh, similarly, I think when we 
funded a large gift for the Hayes Taylor Y. We were uh, continuing a relationship that a long term relationship that Seymour had with the Hayes Taylor Y. But that took many conversations to make a million dollar gift. So every contact may be different, but I think they're very important for establishing the tone of what you want to fund. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Moving to Carly, rule number three. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carly Jones, and I uh, work for the North Carolina Arts Council. So I work on the government side of funding, um, so which is a, a slightly different from working for um, a private foundation. Uh, and so um, I'm coming from a different perspective, similar to what has already been said by Jana and Susan. We all kind of have um, different things that we're looking for and different, even different processes for um, how to obtain the funds um, that we have to give to the community. So I am the Senior Program Director for Artists and Organizations um, and at the North Carolina Arts Council, it's really important um, not just to, to, to pay attention to the different kinds of grants we have. We have lots of different kinds of grants and um, different, we serve different communities throughout the state of North Carolina in different ways. So our team works with individual artists, but also with um, grassroots organizations all the way up to our very large arts organizations throughout the state of North Carolina. So I'll jump to the um, tip that I have. Uh, rule number three is to be clear and introduce yourself. Your application will be reviewed by a group of strangers and you should remember that. So that again is for the North Carolina Arts Council. We come from what's what we call a panel process. So um, our grant applications are reviewed by panelists from the field from throughout the state of North Carolina that are arts leaders um, and also some arts leaders that are also on our board. So the beautiful part about um, the way that we do our process is that I kind of say that the North Carolina Arts Council is like customer service. So we're there to kind of help you through our grants process. And if you're missing something or if you have a question, if you want to get it reviewed before it actually goes to panel, we can do that. Um, and then it goes to the actual panel. But what you need to remember about this panel is that we're pulling arts leaders from all over the state of North Carolina. So they are experts in the field, but they may not know your organization, right? So it's really important, you know, when you're applying for your local arts council, and then you're applying for the state arts council to remember that we may not know um, the great work that you're already doing in the community. We might know the North Carolina Arts Council, but the panelists might not know. So it's really important to treat this kind of like a first date, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, or an audition. I come from the performing arts world, you know, when you go in front of uh, the panel of auditionees, they don't know who you are, so you have to make a good impression. And so you've got to be clear and explain what it is that your organization does in the community? What is your connection to community? What is your connection to the art that you're presenting to this community and why is it needed? And you've got to just break it all the way down. And there might be some panelists who are aware of your work and that's great for them even to just have a refresher, but or they might be um, familiar with a certain part of your work as an organization, but they didn't know that you did this uh, great programming with children or whatnot, you know, so it's really important that you explain um, yourself and um, you're very clear in introducing that. Um, I want to talk about jargon and acronyms, you know, it's really important that you break those acronyms down for these panelists, make it easy for them, make it easy for them to read through your application, understand what you're saying, because you would hate for your application to not get through or for you not to convey the message that you want to convey through your application simply because people don't understand what you're talking about because they don't know the jargon you're using. So make sure you even break down those things. That's really important in being clear and introducing yourself to this group of who are strangers to you. 
So um, I think that's it for my rule number three. So um, uh, that's it for me. Yeah, thank you. We'll be back for more soon, Carly. We are moving to Ruby with rule number four. Hi, bien, buenos dias, welcome, and bienvenidos again. I am, yo soy Ruby Lopez Harper, Vice President, Equity and Local Arts Engagement with Americans for the Arts. Today, I'm zooming in from Silver Spring, Maryland, land of the Nacochtank tribe. I honor and extend my gratitude to all of the original people still living in this region. I'm third generation American con raíces en Michoacán, Mexico. I'm a brown-skinned, abled, cisgender female using the pronouns she, her, ella. My dark brown and pink curly hair is pulled into a loose braid, and I'm wearing a black t-shirt with a quote by Audre Lorde, your silence will not protect you. I describe myself as Mexican mother, wife, daughter, dancer, photographer, poet, and social justice warrior. My work has focused on local arts development, equitable access, grant making, fundraising, supporting individual artists, community development, economic development, cultural tourism, marketing, and public art. I draw on a varied background that includes corporate affairs, community relations, volunteerism, employee engagement, marketing and communications, and business administration. And related to today's topic, I've done grant writing, reading, reviewing, uh, construction of grant programs at the local, state, and national level, in addition to reading, writing, and reviewing for higher ed grant programs and private funding opportunities. Um, so my rule today is uh, start early, pause often. You know, I think to they, they put me in a good spot when organizing the flow of how all of these rules work together in order to advance your grant writing uh, skillmanship. And, you know, the start early, pause often. So a lot of the elements that you've already heard from really can't exist in spaces where you're rushing. And I cannot say enough to resist the urge to copy and paste. You know, back to Susan's, uh, I'm sorry, Jana's, uh, or Susan's love language and, you know, Susan's connecting uh, and, and, you know, Carly's introduce yourself. All of that takes time and takes thoughtful, intentional construction. If you're reflecting on all of the elements and you want to fully respond to the questions being asked in the application process, all of that is going to take time. You're going to need to be able to step away from it and come back to it and snip here and, and fill there and clarify this and maybe eliminate that. Um, you know, along with that, it, you know, use all the space that you're going to have available within that. And you really can't do that if you're just rushing around trying to make the deadline. Um, you know, so being aware of what movements are happening, when things are due and all of that, again, building on knowing the funder that you're going to be approaching. Um, you know, extra eyes. If you start early, it gives you more time to engage other people in the process. Back to Carly's note about, these are strangers probably reviewing your, your application inside a review process. Invite people outside of your organization, unrelated to the work that you do, participants in your programs or staff, to read the questions and read your responses. To so make sure that things are clear and that things are aligned and that things uh, are making sense because that's kind of what you're gonna be going into when you're going through the process. Proofread, spell check, brevity and clarity. I know sometimes we wanna put in also, also very, very, but it doesn't add any meat or meaning to your application. So, you know, take the time to work through your responses. And then make sure that, again, your responses are robust and that they're responsive to the question being asked. A couple of pet peeves as a, as a continuing uh, grant reviewer, people not using all of the space allocated to each response. Fill that space. And if you run out of things to say, start connecting the dots with your application and the organization, their goals, their intent. You know, it, it doesn't hurt to say, and as I stated here, or and in addition to, and then just fill it in. Um, and then make also sure that you're taking up that space to be clear that you're not leaving those, uh, those questions um, unanswered. And with that, I will pass to the next panelist. Thank you, Ruby. And last but certainly not least on our panel, we were tossing it to Darlene McClinton with rule number five. 
Yes, hi, my name is Darlene McClinton, Grants Manager here at Arts Greensboro. Um, we fund nonprofit art organizations and individual artists. And my rule is five, editing an application with Grammarly or ask a professional writer. So editing is critical to a grant proposal because it increases the likelihood that the proposal evaluators can focus undistracted on written words, easily digest key messages and arguments, improve the logic and clarity of the information presented. Ruby hit on that earlier. Create a consistent and unified voice throughout the application. Walk away and reread with fresh eyes. Um, you also want to download a grammar software program such as Grammarly or Gender, which are comprehensive grammar and language checkers. These programs are free of charge unless you want to, you know, get some advanced tools and courses additional money. Um, or you can utilize the traditional method and have an English professor or a professional writer read over your grant. And also you can have someone that does not know anything about you or your organization to read over it so they can look at it with fresh eyes and give you advice or things that you may want to change on your um, grant application. I do want to give one example. In my position as a grants manager, I see the process from the beginning, middle to the end. So for instance, we were in a panel discussion and one of our grantees misspelled a word that was connected to the name of their company. And one of the evaluators scored them very extremely low. And they said it was because of the lack of attention to detail. So those are small little things that you just want to pay attention to um, before you submit your grant application. Darlene, Jana is up with rule number six. So rule number six is more is not always better. And um, I want to preface this with saying that um, there is such good advice from all these panelists. I, I think I looked like a bobblehead. I was nodding so much um, as you were talking. But I think what I heard overall is relationship, that this is a relationship. I heard the words from Carly first date and Susan talking about visiting and Darlene and Ruby talking about engaging other people in the process. So I do believe that, especially in today's day and age, it really is about a relationship. It's not sending something up into the atmosphere and hoping that, that somebody catches it and gets excited about what you're doing. Um, so more is not always better. So we heard from a number of people that follow the guidelines and give the funder exactly what they need, fill in their space, Make sure that you're meaningful, refer back. And I'll give you a little cheat sheet on this. We, our application is coming at your program from a lot of different areas. And we do that intentionally because we pull portions of that into a summary page. So when you are doing your history or your mission or you're doing others, we're pulling all of that. We put it, get it into a one pager that's going to people that don't know you that are reviewing it. Now, our job, I heard someone say customer service, I think it was Carly, our job is to walk through that process with you. And I will always say, if I'm reading your application and I'm about to go to committee and we're planning and I have a concern or I have a question or something that I need needs a rationale behind it, I my job is to make sure we put the best foot forward. And I don't mind doing all of that grant support on the front end. I love working with you all and really tweaking and fine tuning to make sure that we get it to the best possible place before it goes to that committee. So back to the rule where more is not always better is sometimes you can get a little off point and off mission if you are trying to give them everything about you in one in one paragraph. And what that does is it dilutes what your priorities are and what your mission is. And we want to make sure that we're being, and I think it was Darlene, I think you mentioned brevity and being concise. Every single word matters and be consistent in that. So um, aside from messaging could sometimes distract from core issues. If you've talked with your program officer and talked with others and you know specifically where you're going, 
um, with the application and then you throw a curve ball in, in that piece and that may get your committee going off on a whole tangent that neither one of us want to go off on. Um, and that's why we like to keep it focused. So um, anyway, I'm open for questions uh, afterwards if anyone wants to talk about this further. So I'm going to turn it over to Susan or back to you, Ryan. I think, um, thank you, Jana. And I think Carly is up with rule number seven. Great. Uh, yes, all of this, like you said, Jana, I'm just nodding. Yes, yes, yes. All of this is such crucial information. Uh, so yeah, rule number seven, if the application asks for work samples or support materials, start gathering those well before the deadline. A grant with a beautiful narrative and budget with no evidence attached to it in the support materials or work samples makes for a weak application. So um, this I tell everybody, you know, if I'm contacted, if we put out our grant um, uh, requirements out and I get questions, this is what I always tell people is it's easy, you know, to want to hop right into the narrative and type all about yourself and, and um, you know, jump into that part of it. But at the end of the day, if you have this beautifully crafted narrative that has brevity, and you know, are all the things that we've been talking about, yet you don't have the evidence about how well planned your programming will be, um, then you just have to remember it's up against other applications that do have that. This is many times, you know, with the North Carolina Arts Council, we have competitive grant categories. And so um, the parts uh, like work samples and support materials can sometimes take the most time because you're not in control of that. You have to contact the artist that you're hiring for your program so that they can get you um, professional photos of their work or video footage of their work. Um, so just to break this down, there's work samples, and this is for the North Carolina Arts Council, but there are work samples, which is what is the work that we are looking at to support? So what is the art? What is the project? Who is the artist? And then there are what we call support materials. So those could be contracts showing that you actually have contacted this artist and they are excited to be there and a part of your programming. That's letters of support. If you have um, community partners that you've discussed in the narrative, it's great to have a letter of support to show that you aren't just saying, oh, this would be a great idea, but you've actually contacted people in the community and they're excited about this project as well. Um, sometimes itemized budgets, if there's not a place within the application for a more itemized budget, showing that, showing that you really put a lot of thought into that, um, marketing plans, all of these things are examples to show that you have, you are doing this project, you are doing this work, and that it is well planned. And all of those things take a lot of time to get together. It's not something to Ruby's point that you can just get together at the last minute, right before the deadline, you know, if, if you're bringing in, um, I don't know, uh, if you're, if you're bringing in a, a famous uh, Yo-Yo Ma, you know, then you've got to get <laughs> the letter from Yo-Yo Ma, more, you got to give him way more time to get that letter to you or that contract to you or a letter of support saying he's coming than um, three days in advance of the deadline. So, um, and those things really do matter because once again, back to my first rule that I shared with you, this is a group of strangers that do not know you. And so you have to show that this is not just some pie in the sky idea that you want to do. While that's all well and good, at the North Carolina Arts Council, we're stewards of money that comes from the government. We get money from the NEA and we get money from the state legislature. And we have to make sure that we're giving it to projects that will actually happen. And so the way you can help us do that is to make sure that you prepare your work samples and your um, support materials well in advance. 
Thanks, Carly. And we are getting a couple questions in the Q&A, and so we'll plan to address those at the end of our time together. But one came in in the chat just while you were talking, and so maybe we'll spend just a minute here with any additional responses to it. Sunny asked if professional photography is required or if you think uh, photos from a phone would work. And so Carly, maybe first, if you have any thoughts and if there's any, any, any other short thoughts to that, we can address that before we move on. Absolutely, that's an excellent question. Um, I'll speak from the North Carolina Arts Council's perspective. Um, we have been doing a lot of work with arts equity and we realize that not everyone has the means to get a professional photographer for their work. Um, as I said earlier, we work with communities from all over the state and 80% um, of our counties in the state of North Carolina are in rural areas. So um, absolutely, you can use photos from a phone. Um, if you have professional photos, awesome, you know, but it's definitely not a requirement. What you want to think of when you think of work samples is once again, to the point of showing a group of strangers, can they see the work? from this work sample. Are they able to see what I'm describing in the narrative in this work sample? So, and same goes for videography. If you, if you don't have a videographer, totally fine to do something with us with a cell phone. Um, and in fact, we actually really like to see, especially if there's like teaching artists involved or, or class involved, we like to see that in action. Um, and so oftentimes you're not going to have a professional uh, videographer or photographer um, in those kinds of settings if it's for a project that is like that. We want the, the work sample to be authentic. Um, and just to add to that too, that, you know, make sure that the professional that you use, and I say quote unquote, because some people vary in, in the degree and experience that they understand what you're trying to do with it. Because I've seen as a, a panelist, as a reviewer, you know, these very well edited, gorgeously shot that basically don't give me any sense of the experience, the engagement, the enjoyment. I mean, it's just like these, you know, random shots pushed together and they're gorgeous if they're taken not for that purpose. So, you know, as you're also talking to your videographer, your photographer, your folks that are documenting the process and the experience, the outcome, the performance, let them know that you are also using this and give them a sense of what you're going to want um, so that you can get that at the end. Because just because they, they shoot what happens on stage doesn't mean that that's the best representation or the best way to represent the work that you're then going to be submitting for support or as an example of the, um, of the way that your organization engages with a community. So make sure that you're having those conversations with folks that are doing that work for you. Thanks, Ruby and Carly. Oh, Jana? Can I just add one thing? I, I would just like to say that we would never expect anyone to spend money to apply for funding. So if that means you, you know, we provide some of the grant support, we do that. If you need help with your reporting, we'll do that. If you feel like you need um, photography or videography or something to tell your story, talk to your program officer about including that in the grant. Um, that may be something that is, a, you know, a capacity building opportunity for you to be able to tell that story. And that could be, it could be something to ask for. That's all really great feedback, um, and I echo it. We're going to go to Susan with rule number eight. Okay, so rule number eight is make your plans for accomplishments clear as well as those for measuring success. Um, when SAMLA board members review grant requests, they actually have a ranking chart that they use that helps them in their decision making and in their discussion with other board members and included in the, what they're looking at is, does the grant fit SEMO's vision statement? That's kind of obvious, but is what will be different clear? Is uh, why, why is the in grant important? Is that clear? Are plans for accomplishing the outcomes clear? And is there a plan to measure success? 
So I think this is building on comments made earlier. The grant application needs to be thorough, but it needs to be easily understood. And thinking about this, once read, will the board members be able really to give an elevator speech about the request? Looking at those uh, items I just mentioned, will they understand what you're doing, what will be different, and how will we and you know that you've been successful? Other things that you might think about um, to, when you're thinking about clarity and challenges and measurements and results would include um, if a foundation is going to fund operations, how long would one expect that to go on? And how would you know when to stop the funding? If you were requesting funding for a marketing position or a development position, who's gonna pick up that funding once the grant ends? If you include that you're working with a school system or you're working with another organization, uh, is there a contact person for that? Is there a letter of agreement? All of that needs to be very clear and worked out before the grant is submitted. Our foundation loves to join others in funding. And, um, you know, sometimes I hear from board members, are the, we the only, why are we the only ones they're going to? <laughs> and so we have this opportunity for people to tell us what other funding is committed and what is pending. And pending means you've asked them <laughs> and they've got a deadline for when they're gonna get let you know. It doesn't mean these are the people we wanna ask in the future. So I think that's a real important thing in terms of credibility. Uh, this has already been mentioned, but if the grant application has misspellings, typos, if SEMLA is misspelled, that's not a really good thing. And um, the worst is if your financial information doesn't add up. And, and we do work with the people who apply. We read the applications before we send them, obviously, to our board members. And if there's something wrong, we will go back and ask, you know, or even help uh, refine them. But I mean, it really is a bad thing <laughs> if the financial numbers don't add up. It's just a little disconcerting, I would say. Um, we do make multi-year multi grants. Uh, I have to say, the easiest grant in the world to make is a one-time request for, you know, a van for an organization or refrigeration for a food bank or helping with renovation of a building because it's one time, there's very little evaluation involved and um, there's no angst in the future about, well, what's gonna happen when our funding stops? Um, I think understanding the foundation's perspective is critical. We've talked about that, but how can that be to your advantage? Because we uh, there's a foundation in our community that makes grants. They love the last gift of a capital campaign. Well, that's a really good thing to know about that can help you. And um, I think as far as accountability goes, um, given an update, during the period of the grant, that's not necessarily a required update, but visiting somebody, emailing them, calling them and telling them how things are going is a really good thing to do. And I'll just conclude with, although measurements are really important, we don't expect every grant we make to be successful. And an example of one that was not, it was made really when I first got here was an organization that wanted to work with kindergarten children and measure, uh, they wanted to help evaluate their mental health situation and direct them to resources if they had an issue. And they had federal funding in line with, they just needed the seed money from us. What a great uh, project to invest in. And it was a three-year investment on our part. And in the end, it didn't work because between the school system and parents, they had trouble getting permission for children to be screened. And that was really sad, but at least they tried and there's no penalty involved and it was a great idea. So I think that sometimes we forget that the intent of some of this grant making 
is to be a pilot or a seed project and that we're experimenting and we're lucky because foundations can do that. It's not Ooh. often that uh, government maybe can do that. They can at times, but I think that's a unique aspect of this. And again, back to relationships. If you have the right relationship, people are willing to take more of a risk with you. Thank you, Susan. And Susan started uh, to mention about budgets, which brings us nicely to rule number nine from Carly. Yes, rule number nine, your math needs to make sense. Review your budget. A beautiful narrative without a budget that makes sense is just an idea. So um, this part, I see this all the time, all the time folks that have incredible projects that are community oriented, that are that's serving the community in a way that's not being served. And yet they skip this part and they turn in a grant application with support materials and work samples and a narrative, but then a budget that just is out of whack. And typically at the North Carolina Arts Council, our directors, including myself, will try to catch those, you know, if, if they are submitted in time, you know, and say, hey, I see that this doesn't quite make sense and ask some questions and give you a chance to edit that. But not every funder will allow you to do that. So it's really important going back to what's been previously said to don't be scared of us. You know, we're, we're people. I used to be in your shoes where I was writing the grant applications. You know, we're here to help. And if you have a question about your budget, then, um, or you just want us to look, review the application inclusive of the budget, then take that opportunity for sure, because us as grantors will definitely catch math that doesn't make sense, because I hate going to panel and seeing an application that I truly believe in tank, because it simply doesn't make, the, the, the math doesn't make sense. So um, also make sure that your budget is consistent with your narrative. So if you say that you are going to be charging admission in your narrative and, um, you know, there'll be $10 tickets and accessible to, you know, you talk about uh, how you're going to, your charging structure, and yet you go to the budget and it says zero next to admissions, you know, that, <laughs> you know, so there's a level of proofreading, right, that goes along with the budget as well to make sure that it's consistent with what you've said in the narrative portion of your application. So, um, you know, budgets aren't my favorite thing either, even though I work for a granting organization, I much rather, you know, I'm a people person, um, you know, so I get it, but it's necessary. It's necessary for us to be able to make um, sound decisions. Susan mentioned, you know, um, the difference between you know, private funders and the government, you know, we, we do, as I said earlier, we have to be sure that, you know, we're stewards of this, fund, of this money. So we have to assure our panelists that, you know, this is a sound um, project to get behind and to fund. And um, you'll help us be able to present that to the panel by making sure that your math makes sense. Thanks, Carly. We have Ruby with rule number 10. Rule number 10. So one, um, I think, lives in a space of uh, abundance mindset that um, at some point in your uh, organizational history, you'll be approached to be given a grant versus having to go through, I think, a lot of the um, work of the application and, and relationship building, but I still think that even in this moment with everything that we've already talked about, it's still a really important thing to maintain and a, and a rule in terms of successfully uh, accessing and achieving um, is that it's okay not to take a grant. I know that we are driven um, in some really artificial ways, which, um, as I mentioned earlier, I feel really strongly about equitable access to resources, participation, and distribution, uh, and, and how we, as uh, philanthropy at large, but also uh, uh, funders in the arts you know, specifically, think about the way that we are uh, leading and stewarding and, and 
the structures that we create in order to, to distribute. And within that, I think it's also important for organizations to really think about, is this the right grant opportunity? That we do not have to always rely on the generosity of uh, society at large to support the work that's happening. Sure, it's a great way to offset and to augment and to diversify and to strengthen your revenue streams. If you've heard, you know, it's important to show that there are other uh, people participating, that one single funder isn't carrying the load, you know, all of those great things. But at the same time, I think it's important to make sure that the funds that you're receiving uh, align with the work that you're doing and the and the the aspiration that you have for your work in in your community, that it isn't gratuitous, that it isn't tokenizing, that it isn't um, simply at the benefit or at the um, at the whim or the behest of the funder that you are uh, engaged with, but that it is also a meaningful proposition for the future that you see for your organization and the work that you see your organization engaged in. And even when it's really hard, I was just going at it with our um, own uh, development team that like, well, do we have to do we have to like we're kind of in a moment where we could say no, thank you, and that would be okay. Because you need to think about not just mission creep, but capacity for your organization. Do you have the resources in place to pull this off? And um, you know, also thinking about uh, intention and purpose. And so, if you're in a position to be uh, invited or or given, um, you know, make sure that you have that conversation. You do have agency to say this is amazing, but here's what it's really going to take for us to pull this off. And where, how do we build that relationship? Or thank you. Now is not the right time, but can we you know keep the door open for when we are in a better position to execute on that and that desire? So uh, that would be uh, my number ten. It's okay not to take a grant. <laughs> thank you, Ruby. Darlene with number 11. Yes, submit the grant proposal early. Have you ever heard the saying, to be on time is to be late and to be early is to be on time. So use that when you're writing your grant proposals. Start early to give yourself plenty of time for writing, reviewing the process, assembling the final packet. Submitting the proposal on the due date itself should be the last resort. Um, a rule of thumb, reserve at least two days to complete the final edits and the package, the proposal for the submission, so that if anything goes wrong with the submission process, you still have time to resubmit and still make the deadline. So you really don't want to work, wait to the last minute. For mailing submissions, place in the mail four to five days before the deadline, get a tracking number. Um, for electronic submissions, sum submitting the proposal 24 to 48 hours in advance. Confirm the receipt of the proposal. So for, and as an example, again, as a grants manager here, um, we see a lot of grants coming at 11.59, right on the dot. The office is closed. None of us are sitting by our computers waiting for your application to hit the desk. So um, like Carly was saying earlier, you're uploading um, photographs, people are having issues, they can't do this document, they can't upload their budget, they can't upload their receipt. But if you turn your application in early, it gives you enough time to reach out to us and we can help you troubleshoot those problems. So that's one of the main reasons why you want to submit your application early if possible. Thanks, Thanks Ryan. And we're going to go to Ruby with number 12, but I just would say with Darlene's, it's also like, I'm not a panelist, but I'm going to offer this. <laughs> uh, you know, if you get it in at the very, very last minute, it also can hinder staff's ability to provide some last minute support to you to cross some T's and dot some I's that you may have overlooked in your proposal. And so getting it in early also offers the potential that someone from the staff will be able to reach out and say, oh, you might want to resubmit this piece for one reason or another. So last but certainly not least, rule number, and then we have a couple questions. So we will try to address those that are in the Q&A. Um, so Ruby, number 12. So uh, gosh, almost a decade ago, I went to a workshop at the annual convention um, that the Americans for the Arts puts on. And there was an, oh no, it was Grant Makers in the Arts, their annual conference. And there was this amazing workshop that was uh, top 10 dating 
tips for uh, grant writing. And the one that always stuck with me and that I always use in subsequent workshops and um, you know talk a lot about is uh, don't drunk dial when you um, and ask for feedback. So, you know, it's funny, relationships has been quite a theme. We've talked a little bit about first dates, first impressions. You always have to remember last impressions too. And I think, you know, we put so much work, effort, energy, passion, time, resources into these grant applications. And then you get a generic thanks, no thanks. It, you know, supply exceeded demand. It was an incredibly competitive, it always is, no doubt. But how many dear Johns, how many dear Janes, how many dear, you know, every, any, 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 any every person's name um, letters can we uh, accept and receive and not start to feel like it's totally me and not you. Um, but it is, it's, it's important in that moment to not let your emotions get the better of you. It's important in that moment to take a deep breath and remember that a decline is just a decline. It is not an indictment or an indication or a uh, statement or judgment on the value of the work that your organization is doing or the, the, the validity of your space in your community, that it is simply, uh, you know, sometimes it is more, you know, more, more demand than supply. It, it is, you know, maybe it just wasn't up to snuff because it's a competitive process. And so all of these things that you've learned today play into all of that, take a deep breath, accept that it wasn't a judgment on your organization. It was just the content of the application that people were assessing and give it a, give it a week, two weeks, give it a month, and then contact that uh, funder and invite dialogue around feedback. What can we do better? Was there something the, the panel didn't hear? A lot of funders, both private and public, uh, will offer uh, open panel sessions where uh, applicants can sit in and listen. Take the time to go and listen, whether you do it in person, whether you do it by, a lot of groups are doing it by phone now, um, or they're offering you know, access to the recordings, or they will also embed an invitation to have that conversation in their determination letter. Sometimes they'll um, summarize panel comments to at least give you an, a glimpse of what, um, you know, what, what the thinking was around it. Use that and then make the improvements and then use all of the rules that you've heard today to build that relationship with that funder if you really feel that that's a place that you need to be in. Um, and, and again, just remember, you know, take a deep breath. It's not you. Um, and, and try again. Thank you. Thank you, Ruby. Um, I would say to the panel that you can view the questions that have been submitted in if you pop open the Q&A box. And so if you'd like to provide direct responses, um, Susan looks like has done that to a few of the questions. So feel free to chime in. There's a, there is a bit of a theme though that I'll prop up to the group in case there's others that are interested about new nonprofits. And if we feel like that the rules that have been shared today should apply or do apply for new nonprofits. And then also, what do you think about, you know, the, I think the question was, is it, you know, can a, can a nonprofit in the startup stages request funding? And so just some general thoughts and response to, to questions from new nonprofits from whoever would like to, to respond to that. So I'll jump in here. Um, so for the North Carolina Arts Council, uh, yes, you can apply for grants um, even without, um, a 501c3 status. If you are in the process of um, getting that 501c3 status, then you can apply um, with what we call a fiscal agent. So that is um, an organization that has their 501c3. And it, for us, it doesn't have to be an arts nonprofit. It can be one in your community that you have a relationship with already. Um, and so that um, there, there's more language about that on our website. Um, so you can certainly apply with the support of what we call a fiscal agent. So um, the funding would actually be funneled through them to you, if that makes, if that makes sense. So, um, and then for our new grant category that we started this year, um, you can apply um, without, a, um, without a 501c3 status um, 
with a fiscal agent as well for our arts equity project grant category. So um, I'll put a link in the chat for that, um, but it's always been a standard practice for us um, that you can apply with a fiscal agent um, if you don't have your 501c3 status just yet. And even if you don't plan on getting your 501c3 status for the arts equity project grant, you can still apply with a fiscal agent. So I'll put that in the chat here. Thanks, Carly. And I'm going to offer just one last question, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, that it, any any of our panelists have feedback or insights around free grant writing services or places where organizations with really limited capacity might look to for support as they take on grant opportunities, Ruby? Um, so one you could see um, is... Uh, Oh my God, volunteer choice, I think has a place where you can post for folks to volunteer to, so to work with your organization in different capacities. And one you can ask for would be grant writing support. Also the Association of Fundraising Professionals has chapters across the country. And um, a lot of times folks that belong to that as a membership organization um, are, are people like me who are looking for uh, places where I can volunteer my time, or places where I can continue to hone my own skill set by working with organizations, you know, kind of outside of my job um, in order to do that. And also, you know, check with uh, your program participants, check with your board, check with, uh, you know, volunteers that already support you. Some of them um, are going to also be able to speak with a really authentic voice about your organization, because I think that's the balance working with an outside grant writer versus working with someone that's connected to your organization who is a good writer um, is that the, the, the learning curve is longer or shorter in terms of them being able to authentically portray the work of your organization in context. Context and content is uh, much smaller when you're working with somebody who already is familiar and passionate about your organization. Ruby, can you repeat the fundraising, the website that you yes. mentioned? Yes, um, Association of Fundraising Professionals, um, AFP. There's a national and then um, there are typically local chapters in most communities, um, if not kind of regional areas. So um, Association of Fundraising Professionals. All right, I'm going to turn it over to my friend Katina to wrap it up. But before I do, just I'll say my word of big, big, big thanks for the panel and all that you have shared with us and for the 70 some folks who uh, registered and joined us uh, as viewers. Uh, thank you. And Katina. Thank you so much to our panelists. I was taking notes. I've been doing this for a long time, but you guys are our rock stars and I really appreciate it. I think the theme today is program officers and funders are our friends and they're there to help us. So um, thank you all so much. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Steve. We'll be following up with a feedback survey. Please let us know what you thought about this. Please give us feedback. Uh, we really want to do more of this with you. We'd love to partner again with Steve and Ryan. Uh, thank you again for everyone for participating, um, and um, we'll see you next time.